business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Standing there alone, the ship is waiting, all systems are go. Are you sure? Control is not convinced, but the computer has the evidence. No need to abort. The countdown starts. Watching in a trance, the crew is waiting, nothing left to chance. All is working, trying to relax. Up in the capsule, send me down a drink. Jokes, Major Tom. The count goes on. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 86. I'm Tom Merritt. Howdy, folks. I'm Brian Brushwood, and, and that was Neil Bedecker rocking your brains out with Major Tom. Did you notice how the uh, the key was the same as the frame rate song? No, that was brilliant. Yeah. I did that on purpose, actually. Now yeah. that I think, well done, it. well yes. done with that. Uh, so, yeah, you could you could so you could watch the entire horrible karaoke video if you want. Yeah, which which made like a uh, like a, a a guest like 10 second appearance yeah. on the Breaking Bad episode, but they actually recorded the entire thing with them. <laughs> and I love I love the fact that they got uh, what is that? Tagalog right there? <laughs> no, no, that's not Tagalog. I don't know what that is. Singapore or or uh, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's, it's got I am told that it's Thai. Okay, okay, oh, it's Thai. There you go. Can we just leave this going the entire time? Do I have to put the camera back on me? <laughs> no. That, it, just, 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 just whatever makes you happy, Brian. Right on. There you go. I'll just do this the entire time. All right. Uh, because we have a guest who we can talk to instead. John Cabrera, co-writer and co-creator of H+, Plus, is with us today. Thanks for joining us, John. Yeah, my pleasure. Did you know you were going to get treated to Breaking Bad karaoke? <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm sorry we and didn't I'm, warn and you. And I'm better for it. Thank you for that. <laughs> so... Before before we begin, we have to give a huge thanks to friend of the show, uh, Casey McKinnon is the one who linked us up. She went out and saw the premiere of H+. Plus. You guys had like a big event to, to did you show the entire series or just a piece of it? How did that go down? Yeah, well, we have, we've actually had two, uh, two of these events, one in Los Angeles, which Casey was at. And then we uh, just recently had another one in uh, New York City. And no, we did not show the entire uh, series. And um, we actually did something a little interesting. We, we actually didn't show the series in the same order that it's going to be um, coming out online oh, really? um, or, or the way that it was written. Um, yeah. So, so, that's, so that's, you, did that's what Fox, the... you did what Fox did to Firefly intentionally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, that's part of the that's that's part of the. Um, the concept for for the piece is that um, is that it's uh, it's told out of order. It's it's a nonlinear story, and um, you can enjoy it in a variety of ways through the eyes of one character. Um, you know, following uh, a chronological path backwards, forwards, um, and you can mix it up. And we're, what we're hoping is that is that um, audiences actually take that into their own hands and create their own playlists that mimic television shows um, that could be as long as, you know, 45 minutes in length or two hour, two hours in length. I mean, the total content, um, the, the entire story is is um, four, four TV hours um, so of, uh, of story. Is, this is almost like you guys are embracing what has been a problem in the Star Wars world. Of course, people trying to decide, like, do you watch them all chronologically? Do you watch them all in release order? Or you have, you know, the machete order, which kind of chops them all around or maybe takes out the, uh, the, the very first episode. You're encouraging that kind of fan involvement where it's like you curate your own experience with this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, cur we're hoping that curating becomes a big part of the series experience um, and, and not just to um, 
to enrich the actual community and experience, but also to help inform us, I think, you know, um, you know, in, in, in terms of what this is. I, I remember at the screening itself, uh, and we put this this order together for the screening because we felt like it was a better order for a screening than the order in which we wrote it in. And I remember while I was watching, there were a couple of, of, of episodes that were back to back in the screening that I, that had never, I'd never considered them before the screening being back to back. And, um, and there were, there were some moments of, of sort of revelation, even for me of like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't, I, I guess I never saw that. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, we've talked about H plus we've shown a couple of the previews and we talked about the interviews with Brian Signer. Uh, for those who don't know, how do you give an elevator pitch for what's happening with H plus? Okay. Well, um, it uh, it's a story that takes place in in the near future, a very relatable near future. We always like to say, um, you know, it, it's a future that looks as much like today as twenty years ago looks like today. Um, it, but it's a future in which thirty three percent of the world has retired its cell phones and laptops and iPads in favor of a new form of computer, which is an implanted computer, connects our nervous systems to the internet and allows us to watch hallucinatory television, hear music in our heads, chat with people all around the world, sort of inside of us. And the story begins with something something going wrong, and that 33% dies, um, leaving, a few, a, a, leaving a few survivors with H+, um, as well as this 66% of the world that still, that did not have H+, and changing the, you know, social and political landscape of the planet and, and prompting the, the characters that we follow in the series to sort of figure out what happened. And, and, and we, the audience, are also trying to figure out what happened um, by jumping around a timeline uh, that spans uh, almost 20 years. And, and so uh, the way that we wrote it is that each episode sort of flip-flops between before the event or after the event. So, you know, episode one would be before the event. Episode two might be like three minutes after the event. Episode three might be nine years before the event. Um, and, you know, so we just kind of jump back and forth in that in that order. So uh, now one of the things we've talked about before is is one of the things you can do with the digital series is you don't have to conform to the regular release schedule. And it sounds like you'll to some extent fans will be able to decide their own way of of consuming this. Are you going to release all the episodes at once, all four hours and just sort of have suggested playlists or is it going to come out incrementally? And, and how does how does ad sales affect the way you guys decide that kind of thing? Because obviously, if you have an artistic vision, you don't want to compromise it. But there's also a reality for trying to have the thing make money in a platform, in a digital platform on YouTube. Well, I mean, I think that that's the big experiment. Um, uh, you know, we I, 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 I don't think anyone um, is is of the belief that we've that we've figured out exactly how this is going to make money. Um, you know, obviously it is, uh, you know, this is going to be ad supported. So that's our hope that it that it receives enough views that um, that this kind of content is a viable way to to make money. Um, and I think that, you know, to answer your first question, I think that we're sort of straddling a, a line between what we want to do release schedule wise. So what, what we're going to what we're planning now is to have a very aggressive opening where we release a lot of the episodes, um, uh, you know, on August 8th. Um, we've talked uh, we've talked about how much that that would be. My hope is that it's um, more, uh, you know, m more episodes than 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 less. Um, uh, yeah, because you say new episodes every Wednesday, but that doesn't yeah. mean that it's so just that, one. You're gonna get you're gonna get several. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so cool. we all we, we certainly will be giving more than one episode every week, um, at least two episodes a week. Um, the first two weeks are going to be very aggressive. We're going to have a lot of episodes within um, within the first two weeks, and by the end of the first month, um, there should be plenty for people to to uh to start playing around with and, and the experience itself is is going to be about a five month five to six month experience um because we're going to have, have other stuff i mean it's a it's a uh, a premium channel on on youtube it's it, it's um so we have to we have to fill the channel with more than just wednesday episodes so um you know there's going to be um stuff with me uh 
and, and some of the creators, um, you know, talking about the series, uh, engaging with fans. Um, we're creating extra content, um, ancillary content, you know, that that right now is sort of serving as somewhat marketing content, getting people to, to get excited about the series, but um, is being crafted by the creator so that it fits within the mythology of, of the story. So one of the stories that we had before, of course, with was uh, Brian Singer's involvement. And of course, him, him being involved with traditional movies and, and having said in the interview that, you know, he hopes that there's still a place for people to take their dates to go to movies. But obviously, it's very forward thinking for him to embrace an experimental series on the new media platform. How did you get Brian Singer involved in, with all this? Well, uh, you know, when we first conceived of the idea, so we, we, we this journey began six years ago, um, actually. Wow. This, yeah, we, Cosimo and I first started developing it, you know, in, you know, in our own office here uh, six years ago. And shortly after, we started taking it around. At that point, we didn't really know what it was. Um, we, we, we just had a big story world with lots of characters that were all, um, that had all experienced this, this same event and um and and we knew that we just had this really nice dense mythology that we could build into something so we started taking it around we took it to to you know feature people and television people and we took it to to bad hat to bad hat harry which is brian singer's production company and we we sat down with several of the producers and um and they really loved it and we uh and we soon after connected with warner digital and it was just one of those things where, and mind you, at this point we hadn't written anything. All you know, all we'd really done is just collected notes and, and ideas, and, and essentially came up with a pitch for it. Uh, and and we sat down and we were like, "This is an internet series. Clearly, it's an internet series." Um, and from that moment on, that's that's all it was, and that's what that's what we build. In fact, there are a lot of sort of cinematic conventions and story conventions that we use in this series that I know we wouldn't have used had we, we, we probably wouldn't have even thought of it had, uh, had it been in a different medium. So this has always been for web and, um, Brian and the producers at Bad Hat have always been supportive of that, uh, supportive of that. And, um, and, and I, going back as, 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 as far back as 2008, when they officially came on, They've all they've been talking about how they believe in in the internet and they they believe that it's that it's the space that they need to get into and and, and need to explore. I so, get the uh, sense that you and Cosmo are fans of technology because you've definitely captured the sense of you know lining up for Apple products, uh, the Google Glasses sort of enthusiasm. Some of this stuff definitely. I mean, the iPhone and Google Glasses were not around six years ago, but yeah. you've got that gestalt in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I keep saying, like, the, you just said it, the iPhone wasn't around when we first started to, to oh, develop yeah. this, right? So, um, and and more specifically, that sweeping and swiping vernacular that we have now in, in, in yeah. tech products, right? Like, that that didn't exist. You know, it was styluses and, and tapping with your finger. On That's your all palm we really trio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and a big part of what Stuart Hendler um, created, he created this this vocabulary in the series, um, you know, with the characters actually engaging with their their hallucinatory interface in front of them. That is this this sweeping and swiping vernacular. It's become um, one of the symbols of the series. And I always think like, God, you know, six years ago that people probably wouldn't have totally gotten that it wouldn't have been as as um as powerful as it is now in a world where we're constantly sweeping things with our fingers and and whatnot and i think that there was some uh you know throughout the years i think when you know technological um you know or products technological advances started happening that were in line with what we were writing in the series, there was this this mixed feeling we have, like, oh no, like, will we get this thing out in time, or will, or will all of this, uh, you know, like, will all of this be passe by the time that we, we get will it out Google there? Will Google come out with Google Plus? Oh wait a minute, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Along those lines, once you realized that what you had was an internet series and not anything that would ne would necessarily fit with traditional television or movies. Did was that like a giant gate opening up, and all of a sudden you saw new possibilities in storytelling, or or were there emergent properties that you ran across as you tried to tell this nonlinear story? Yeah, 
Uh, for sure, we, it, it, it opened up so many possibilities. And the exciting thing was, because this was such a, a, an experiment for Warner, for Warner Premiere, um, they really embraced that, that as well. Um, and we didn't have the, the traditional studio experience, especially for, for two um, new writers, uh, two young writers who, who had never really worked in the studio system in that way before. Um, you know, my, my background in traditional media was as an actor. Um, so this was really like my, my first, my first chance to kind of be in it. So all of the sort of horror stories that you hear about studios, um, you know, turning things into something that you, that the creators didn't want, we didn't experience that at all. It was, it was very, um, it was very open. The development process was, was constant exploration. And we took a long time to make this thing. You know, I mean, we, we took our time. I mean, it frustrated a lot of people who have been following the series development for a while, wondering why it's taken so long, but it's because, um, we wanted to explore every possibility. And, um, and yeah, I think that, you know, that nonlinear story certainly, certainly came from our, uh, you know, just our format, you know, the web. Well, John, uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat with us about H+, but you're also willing to, to hang around and talk with us about other stuff today. Sure, yeah, I mean, great because like I, said, I hope that I can, I can catch up. Yeah, well, uh, we, we hope that we can catch up usually every week, so you're, you're not alone in that. Let's, uh, let's kick off with the big story. This just in, the big story. I, I should have done this before I kicked the big story, though. YouTube.com slash H plus digital series, by the way, is the place to go. Uh, and, and you said August 8th, right, is when? Uh, yes, August 8th. August 8th is when we launch, but the, but the, uh, or when the series premieres. But the, the YouTube channel is, is already launched, and, you know, you can subscribe now. And we've all, we're already putting content on there. You know, we're already putting story pieces and definitely, definitely watch the previews because, uh, like I said, we've we've shown the preview twice on the show in the past just because it's such an engaging idea, such a cool world that I can't wait to sink my teeth into. All right. Uh, the other big story, besides H+, is Viacom DirecTV have declared peace, and everybody's trying to figure out what it means. So Viacom channels are back on DirecTV now. Uh, DirecTV agreed to a 20% increase for Viacom channels, which you might think is a victory for Viacom, but Viacom was asking for a 30% increase, according to Bloomberg. Uh, either way, Viacom's going to get more money for their channels. The channels are back on DirecTV. DirecTV gets to add Viacom channels to their streaming platform uh, so, so that you can watch them even when you're just on your internet, uh, on like the iPad app, stuff like that. DirecTV did not end up having to take Epix, uh, which was one of the things Viacom was trying to bundle that channel in. That didn't happen. Ryan Lawler over at TechCrunch wrote that DirecTV won the battle. And for the first time, the hearts and minds of the viewers was on the side of the provider, whereas usually it's on the side of the channel. And we're seeing that still. AMC and Dish have not worked out their differences. And it seems like AMC sort of winning the battle for the, for, for the PR there. Uh, Brian, what did, did you agree with Ryan's piece at TechCrunch where he said, like, this, this is a watershed moment? We're going to yeah, see more of these blackouts absolutely. now? Uh, and specifically, that came from a, uh, uh, he says, uh, in a research note to the clients, the Bernstein analysts note, and it's a direct co quote saying, uh, this is the first time it's a critical turning point in programmer distribution negotiations. For the first time in memory, it was the distributor that won the public relations war. And I, I, I think that's right. I, I can't remember another time where, where it happened this way. And I think they played it smart. Now, I don't know how much of that has to do with the fact that Viacom has a reputation that doesn't uh, that doesn't seem to agree well with consumers of being um, sort of sort of pouty, grabbing their ball and going home, and especially the way they yanked stuff even off the internet in the middle of this battle. I think that uh, I think that that to be honest, it wasn't that Directv played their hand so well. I think that Viacom misplayed their hand and uh, and didn't make consumers very happy. Whereas AMC, I think, is very smartly played. They're like, we're on your side. We want you to have the content. It's these jerks, these these suits over there in the Hollywood highfalutin. No, oh, if only we could give it to you for free, we would. They did a great job of framing, framing the debate that way. And I don't think Viacom showed anywhere near 
that level of sub- subtlety. Well, and, and the difference, the biggest difference in what they did with consumers was AMC went out and said, hey, we'll send you, a, we'll, we'll send you a, we'll, to, to where you can get our shows. We'll, we'll set you up with Breaking Bad. We'll, we'll point you to the places where we stream this uh, stuff online or sell this stuff online. Whereas Viacom's response was, no, not only are we going to try to block you from watching it online, but we're going to block people who don't even have DirecTV from watching right. it online. And so uh, the reaction to that was different. John, did you follow this, th- this particular battle much? I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I read a little bit of, about it. Um, I didn't. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a cord cutter. So I, I, uh, I don't, I haven't had cable or direct TV or satellite or anything in years. Um, and, and, but I, I genuinely feel like, um, it's exciting that the idea that, that consumers are sort of winning in, in a lot of these battles. Well, and, and it does seem like, uh, the the consumer opinion definitely swayed the negotiations here. I mean, DirecTV had to cough up a lot of money, but not as much as they would have had to. And I feel like we're seeing a lot more pressure than we used to. The providers used to be a little bit over a barrel. If, if a company had a big channel, like an ESPN or a Comedy Central, uh, that was the only way the consumers could get the content. And I think we saw Viacom blink in response to that, saying, oh, crap, there is another way they can get the content. We don't have DirecTV over a barrel. And yeah. instead, of, instead of doing a smarter thing, which is embrace that, they, they tried to fight against it. Now, do you think there's a case where they feel like the time is running out, the clock is running out, and now, uh, now this is a case where all these content providers have to get as much as they can while the getting is still good? Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot, uh, a lot more of these battles. Whether we actually see it go to blackouts or not, I'm not sure. But I think, I think they're going to get more intense because there's a new, pl- there's a new ground now. There's a, there's a new benchmark, and everybody wants to set it in their favor. Uh, right. So as, as these, these, I think this is the first wave of these agreements coming up. CBS has got one with Directv coming up uh, that's going to be thorny, and you have the added problem with Dish and AMC of that court case over Voom. Uh, where where AMC is suing Dish over the removal of the Voom channel from the Dish service. That goes to court on September 18th, and then The Walking Dead premieres on October 14th. Uh, so those are some significant dates in that battle as well, which make it even more complicated. Uh, Web3815 says, how did the consumer win? They still raised the prices, and that's true, but they didn't raise it as nearly as much as they want, and they didn't force uh, all the Epix channels to be part of the bundle as well. So it's, it's and you, granted, yes, any time that there's raising the fees, it's traditionally not to the benefit of the consumer. However, don't look at it, in this case, I wouldn't look at it as your fees going up 20%. I would look at it as it being you, you got 10% less of a fee increase than you were going to have to, and you didn't have to get a bunch of other crappy channels you don't care about. And I'm not—I don't know if the Epic channels are crappy or not, but no, I mean, the, it's actually a decent movie service. But it'd be like saying, "Okay, we're going to have to force stars right. in here because they happen to be owned by somebody." Uh, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything! It's another big story. Obviously, it's urgent to stop everything because it takes so long (laughs) to tell you. Uh, Digital Domain Media Group revealed last week that it has filed a lawsuit against Prime Focus World alleging infringement of patents on 2D to 3D conversions. And it has been settled out of court. Eva Snyder is a visual effects uh, artist that we've had on the show before, tipped us off to the Studio Daily article about it. What's interesting is that DDMG claims... Everyone is infringing. DDMG chair and CEO John Textor told investors on a conference call, who is infringing? Everybody that has an interest in a 3D film, from the content creators to the production companies to the distributors, the exhibitors, the projector companies, the theaters, down to the television sets and the video games. Now, do they specifically mention which patent? I mean, do they link to the actual patent so you can see how? I mean, and and this is one of the things that kills me about patents is you know, it, it from what I understand, and I'm a an idiot, I'm a brain dead moron who sticks nails in his eyes for a living. But it sounds to me like the patent could be as vague as a process to convert a two dimensional movie into a three dimensional movie, and then all of a sudden they own everything. I mean, you're you're the patent whiz, Tom. What's I am so not a patent whiz. Please don't tar me with that. There's six patents in question <laughs> here, and I haven't read any of them. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to pretend to give you a patent analysis of here. But it is it is typical in these cases to kind of assume like these are bunk patents. But they're probably not. Uh, the thing is, they were acquired by DDMG. 
Uh, they, re they cover, quote, any modern conversion process that involves rotoscoping and relates to any conversion process that includes horizontal image displacement tra slash transform. So it's all a matter of what you can get the court to agree to. It, it, the patent may be perfectly valid and may be perfectly necessary in this case. But if you can get the court to be on your side or even not even go to court, just put the pressure on the right people, they won't want to go to court and, and they'll pay you for it. That's, that's usually what people who are trying to make money off patents do. Uh, and DDMG has said Hollywood Studios that it relies on for vis visual effects work will get a pass. This is a quote. It's fair to say that everybody else other than the studios is fair game. Again, that's the DDMG chair and CEO John Textor. So See, they know which fights they can win and which fights they can't. I mean, I'm, I'm too dumb to know anything about this. So if I sound like I know anything, it's a lie. But it's like when I hear stuff like this, all I think of is like, barnacles on a boat and at some point you just have you know a few barnacles a few licensing fees here or there it doesn't keep the boat from getting to where it's supposed to be but at some point i just get afraid of this gigantic barnacle it's like a freaking coral reef trying to drift along the ocean and it bums me out but but again i don't know enough to really vote one way or the other well, it's, a, yeah. it's a problem with with patents right i mean patents are yes. necessary uh, to protect innovation right that's why we have them is like an inventor wants to get credit and the proper compensation for his invention the question right. is what falls into that that's where the entire argument happens Are, is soft does that the, does that also include the uh, you know 3d film as captured from a camera and not well and, you know, this, it, and that, that's a really good question john because, because he says he says everybody has an interest everybody that has an interest in 3d film right that, so that's what i'm trying to say is the patents edge. may be perfectly perfectly genuine but do they cover Everybody, I mean, does it cover me for seeing in 3D? Do, is that a patent violation? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and even then, you know, consider one of the things we talked about before was there were people over at, uh, at some businesses that tell us that they don't even bother to shoot their 3D movies in using two cameras because they end up just uh, digitally touching it all anyway. So they might as well just shoot it in 2D and upscale it to 3D. It, the calculus will change. I mean, we may end up with like an aereo type situation where if they'd have to pay an extra licensing fee, it makes sense to do the kludgy thing of using two cameras or maybe even three cameras or four cameras just so you can avoid having to pay the license fee on the patents that they have. And DDMG has apparently come under some controversy. They've, they've started an educational arm, which some people feel is just trying to get free work from people by charging them as students instead of paying them as workers. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but there's been accusations about that. Uh, but they're definitely shifting their business plans from relying on Hollywood to pay them for visual effects work to other things. And one of those things apparently is licensing patents. So, well, congratulations, guys. Yeah. Hope it works out for you. I don't know. Let's, move, really let's move on to yet another big story. Involves dancing Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Actually, doesn't it? Well, I guess it could involve dancing girls. Could involve anybody who's a commenter on YouTube. Uh, Brian, you found this story. YouTube gently nudging you into using your real name. Yeah, well, this happened to me this last week, and I thought it was extraordinarily surprising that it happened the exact week. I mean, you remember just one week ago, I was saying, I wonder why there's no personal accountability that anyone can hide behind their, their YouTube name. And of course, they're all just numbers and letters or whatnot, and people say the most horrible, hateful things. As I mentioned, most people would rather get paper cuts on their eyeballs than actually read YouTube comments. And I, I, I was musing on this show why they don't have personal accountability and the ability to track down exactly who this person is saying it and that very week i go online and i make a comment and it says hey you don't want to be schwood.com all spelled out you want to be brian brushwood because that's your your google plus id and so i loved it i thought it was great and and it put a put a face next to it on there and i hope other people do it as well um I, what do you suppose the is this a case where they're just trying to unify everything under the Google Plus architecture, or is this is this partly to fight the trolling comments? Because that's what I thought was interesting, was that the first article I found written about it 
specifically men mentioned, is this the secret weapon against trolls? I, I think it's a match made in, in an awesome meeting between the Google Plus people and the YouTube moderators where Google Plus came into the meeting saying, hey, we'd really like to unify all this stuff and integrate Google Plus in your commenting system. And one of the things we do here is a real name policy. And the YouTube moderators are like, that's awesome. We would love to do that. We would really like people to be using their real names. We think that's an effective moderation tool. Uh, but they're being smart. They're not making you do it because that's a, a recipe for immediate backlash the question is if you don't make it do it then do just the trolls end up not having the real name and and what do you do that john i mean you're you've got a youtube channel yeah what's your guys I actually was think, I was, well i was thinking about this yesterday because i you know I, I i i can't help but read the uh the comments that that are piling up on uh on the on the trailer and um and yeah there's some there's some nasty stuff in there. You're like, it, I, turns, and, and, it turns out my series and, is both fake and gay. Who knew? Yeah, right. yeah. Comments. Um, and, and, you know, and I, and I actually, I, what I was thinking was, I was like, God, you know, I should, um, I should perhaps put my voice into this, into this uh, conversation. And, um, and then I got to thinking, yeah, but then I have to sort of say, like, you know, I've, I've got to tell them, oh, by the way, my name's actually John Cabrera, not this weird, you know, John Johnny Cab 75, you know, blah, blah. So I, I, I love it. I think it's great. I, as soon as I read this, I was like, perfect. But I do think that it's I do think that it's Google Plus. It's inspired by Google Plus. I don't think it's inspired by the trolling. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I wonder what the end game is here, though. That's the thing. I think they're doing the right first steps, which is like, hey, everybody, wouldn't you like to transition to this? Don't have to if you're really against it. But where do you go with that? Do you say eventually everybody has to do it? Do you say, well, OK, now that we've you know, nudged a bunch of people, those who use their Google Plus IDs now have their comments higher than those oh, who I, don't? I mean, what? what I, what, what, I, what I feel like, it wouldn't be something like that. That would be a top-down decision, and that strikes me as very un-Google. What I think they would do is allow you to customize your viewing experience, where they'll say, oh, that's cool. they'll yeah. say hey, you can, would you like only verified comments? These come from people who are accountable. You know who they are. Or do you just want any old person? And essentially, anyone who's had experience would be like, hey, I've noticed that people whose names are nothing but letters and numbers together are kind of dicks. And so I'm going to say, no, I don't need to see any of that. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a really good way to do that. So yeah, or or show it right. Like you know, if you create a if you create a video and and you just you don't even want you don't even want any of those comments to appear for other people to see. Yeah, allow right? you as that a producer. To, yeah, no, that's that's yeah. a, that's great. Right? Google, are you I mean, getting would... all this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Google. Right, this Google's sitting there taking notes. Like, no, oh, this is good. I'm glad I watched Frame Rate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the, a the big middle finger from Google. At, yeah, like we haven't thought of all this. Let's move on to the slipstream. Uh, Slipstream is where we talk about the folks who bring you the video you want to watch on the internet. Uh, Amazon launching a new headquarters in London. Now, on the one hand, it's really just a big four-story building in what's called the Silicon Roundabout, which is where all the tech companies are putting their headquarters, uh, that combines things like Love Film and Push Button, uh, Amazon's streaming partners in the UK. Not partners, they actually own them, uh, in one place. But on the other hand, Amazon's trying to say, look, we're going to be using this to, to push innovation to all kinds of platforms, to gaming, to the web, uh, and to streaming video. We want to innovate from this place. I don't necessarily know what that means, Tom. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's what I was trying to get at. at. On the one hand, it could mean, hey, we spent a lot of money building a big building, and so we have to justify it by saying innovation a lot. Uh, on the other hand, it could mean, no, Love Film used to be over here, and our web team used to be over here, and now they're all going to be together, and we're going to really try to get people to work together and, and come up with some cool things. Let's not that that when it comes to innovation, physical meat space does matter. It's those. It's it mattered when uh, many businesses stopped putting people in. Uh, it mattered that Google is setting up workspaces with with a few people in a group at a time to where it's very easy to lean over and ask a question for someone else. So I don't want to discount that. However, it also seems like a really good way to justify to shareholders why you're spending money to move a bunch of people to be in the same place. Yeah, it could be both, actually. Uh, yeah. Also, YouTube has announced partner rewards. Here's something to shoot for. The golden... Well, what is it? It's a golden play button. So golden, I guess it's kind of like a gold record. Dude, yeah. this is, I, I want this. In fact, I love it. 
Well, I mean, of course you love it. You're a freaking part. Uh, it's like I want to. I want to be eligible to win one of these golden play buttons. I I, I just want the five hundred dollar B and H photo gift card. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty nice. Yeah, you get that to spend on on stuff, uh, and then uh, you get a YouTube branded camera case, uh, and and you get a golden play button to put up on now, the wall. And, and we've no, talked I about this. All, all of these things, on one hand, we kind of want to roll our eyes. We're like, oh, great, self-aggrandizing, giving yourself awards. But these things matter for credibilities. We revere the Oscars now, but there was a time when the Oscars were a made-up, bogus award given by actors to themselves. And now we regard it as a big deal. And it's part of what – it's those trappings of authority that have helped to legitimize – film and canonize it as one of the primary ways we consume our entertainment and it's important that new media to legitimize itself also have these trappings so i'm behind this yeah every partner who has a channel with more than a hundred thousand subscribers got one of these so there were 80 uh publishers who received these and it, it's just as silly as a gold record right sure you know they just yeah. invented yeah. the gold record there you know there wasn't it wasn't a thing before they just decided to do it so yeah, i think it's kind of cool too uh, Amazon getting Warner Brothers shows, uh, getting licenses for West Wing, uh, Fringe, Alcatraz, The Whole Truth. In fact, they have a temporary exclusive on the West Wing, as, if I read this did, right. It's not going to last Alcatraz forever. Did Alcatraz get picked up for a second season? Has that come out yet? You know, I didn't hear if it got picked up for a second season or not. I never, I never ended up watching it. Well, I, and you know me, I'm totally phobic. I, I don't want to have another Firefly experience where I get halfway into a series and I've invested my time and then it's not, not, not going to go anywhere. So it's like, uh, I think most shows... What are you talking now, about? Then you can be the guy who's like, oh, yeah, I watched that right from the beginning, you know? Yeah. I, okay. what, what about me says I want to be that guy? <laughs> Tom, that's not, that's not my goal. <laughs> uh, Amazon spokeswoman confirmed that the exclusive arrangement for Warner TV shows lasts only through the summer. Uh, but it is it is a first for Amazon. Not a first, but it, you know Amazon doesn't get these exclusive as often as, as other services, so it's a good one for them. What did you think of Hulu's simplified uh, UI player for the web? Netflix has already done this. They kind of tried to simplify things down. Uh, it looks very mobile-like. They're moving a lot of stuff around. I, I meant to try it out. I never got around to trying it. Uh, the chatter I saw on the chat room here at Twit was that a couple people didn't like it. But then again, it's hard for me to really take that seriously because we all hate things until suddenly we love them. So I don't know. Have you, have you played with it, John? No, I haven't. Um, I agree. It looks very mobily. Um, I don't know. Is it is it Flash? Do you know? Yeah, I think it's all still Flash. They, they basically just took the transport controls and put them all in a single bar, uh, including like 10-second re rewind, uh, time left in the video, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's just trying to mash all the controls into one place, and then, of course, they disappear like they always did. That's the thing. It's, they, they dis I, I never end up looking at them after I press play because I don't do a lot of pausing. I'll tell you what, man. I used to get really wound up one way or the other. And one thing I've figured out is that uh, human beings were extraordinarily adaptable. And even if we, even if I truly hated it and I thought this was an abomination against user interface, I'm pretty sure within two weeks I wouldn't know the difference anyway. I'd be like, ah, oh, it's fine. you got to click one of these and do one of these over here. That's true, so Brian. Experimenting. Yeah. Even if a third of us had implants that went bad and a bunch of us died, we'd carry on somehow. We'd figure it out. We'd find a way. <laughs> It's the perseverance of the human spirit, Tom. Yeah. Speaking of uh, unbundling, which we were talking about a little bit with that DirecTV Viacom story, uh, Bell in Canada has unbundled its TV networks. You can pick and pay for only the channels that you want. Uh, a risky gambit, says the Financial Post out of Canada, but the aim is to provide greater choice to subscribers. Now, what is, why is this risky? I mean, are they afraid they're suddenly not going to make any money or it's risky because it'll piss off the competition? Or, I mean, it's like when you've got an entire show dedicated to an idea that millions of consumers clearly want, obviously it's not so risky that they're going to go out of business for trying this. I, I wouldn't think. I don't want to pretend that I understand all the ins and outs of how Canadian regulations work, but they had to get the Canadian Radio Television and Telecommunications Commission to approve of this. So that's like getting the FCC to approve. And the CRTC decided Friday to adopt the proposal because they want to charge more. So the, the rates will fluctuate based on the number of subscribers who sign up. I, I don't know which way they fluctuate. I guess if more people sign up, the rates go down. But if you're signing up for an unpopular channel, you're going to pay more. 
I'll tell you what, man, it is fascinating to watch the the destabilization of of the entire cable industry and to see to where to where it's those it's the on the one hand, you don't want to be first to break ranks because it may end up biting you in the ass. But on the other hand, you do want to be first to innovate so that you're ready for the next wave of how consumers uh, consume all of their media like this. So, again, it's another I mean, it's I, another- I think that's sort of what I what what I was getting at with with you know, consumers sort of winning all of this stuff, because I really do see that all, all of these, all of these, all of these battles that are happening. I mean, ultimately, it's just a change. We're just seeing a huge change, a big shift towards I want I want the content that I want. I don't want any of that extra stuff that you're trying to pile on to me. I just want that. Yeah. Give it to me. <laughs> and, and the consumer wins in the end. It's all about how long it takes for right. whatever industry from buggy whips to video to admit that, OK, Nobody needs buggy whips anymore because there are right. no more buggies. Uh, it, it just. But ultimately, I think I, I, I think that really the killer app is going to be the hardware. You know, I really do ultimately think that, you know, as smart televisions start getting into more homes and we get more YouTube buttons on remotes and Hulu buttons on remotes um, and all of those, uh, you know, those, those those different web providers start to step up and and match the, the the quality of content that we see from the cable providers then it's it's game over speaking of hardware devices and game over it's time for tube tops this is the uh, section of the show where we talk about that those hardware devices that stuff you use to watch the shows that you want to watch we only have one story this week not a lot of hardware news uh, an fcc filing spotted by engadget showed that a western digital has a new set top box coming not too far away uh, the WD TV Play will offer support for casual games, things like Sudoku, Texas Hold'em, poker, uh, sort of stuff like that, played through a portal named FunSpot. Also gives you shortcut keys on your remote to Netflix, Vudu, and Hulu Plus. I, it I'll, seems to be the trend to try to get people to pick your box by bundling in video games. Uh, yeah, well, and I, I think that part of that is, is just fashionable. And let's let's face it, when I say Western Digital, you don't immediately think of, you know, affordable set-top box with top-notch entertainment on there. So it's like, I wonder exactly, it's starting to get, thankfully, I guess, question mark, it's a crowded marketplace. I'm not so impressed with the video game playing aspect of this since it's just uh, on the remote using up, down, left, right, and select. But I actually really dig, I have an irrational affiliate. Uh, affection for these shortcut buttons. I love the legitimacy of there being a Netflix button, a Voodoo button, a Hulu Plus button. Um, and I, I actually, I don't know, I'm really curious. To, uh, no price point mentioned on anything of this, right? Uh, no, it's just an FCC filing, uh, so there wouldn't be. But in the past, the Western Digital boxes have been priced in the range of the Roku. Uh, Western Digital started into this business because they make hard drives. And they were mm-hmm. making hard drives that specialized in uh, playback of video direct from the hard drive. And it was just a natural evolution to start making set-top boxes like this. Yeah, that's the weird thing, too, is, is of course, nowadays the, the trend is all to do live streaming, in which case you don't even need a hard drive in there. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I find that fascinating. What do you use to watch your TV, John? Uh, you said you're a cord cutter. Yeah, um, I have a Mac Mini hooked to my uh, hooked to my television. I've had it hooked to my television since 2005, um, and uh, and then I and and I'd say within the past two years, I've been doing a lot of my uh, my TV watching through my PS3. Um, oh yeah, with with uh, with Netflix and um, now with Amazon. Yeah, um, you know, and then I also. I, uh, for stuff that I that because I don't have cable, I haven't had cable for, forever, and I and I have some shows that are my my you know the, they're my shows. Um, I I just go to friends' houses to to see that, and and that for me, I, uh, watching television is so, such a social experience anyway that that it sort of works. You don't consider that stealing going to a friend's house and watching it? No. <laughs> No. Not at all. <laughs> I'm no. hip to what you're doing, Tom. I'm wise to your shenanigans, sir. We all have none of it. Let's move on to Film Found. Uh, by the way, uh, the chat room has pointed out that uh, BigDWeb.com has a lovely selection of buggy whips, if you are in the market. <laughs> so, there you I'm go. sure they do. Uh, film found all about the places where you can find the stuff to watch. And USA Today has launched an internet video guide uh, that's pretty comprehensive and 
you know, aside from including things from Twit, like Tech News Today under the tech category, seems to be pretty comprehensive, too. Did they really do that? They put Tech News Today? They, they had, uh, yeah, they had This Week in Tech and Tech News Today in there. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, and, now, was this just a one-off, like, there's this thing called Web TV you should get used to, or, or is it eventually going to be like their version of the TV guy? The no, TV. it's our top picks of the week for July 23rd, 2012. There's the tech guy with Leo Laporte right up there on the top. Jeff and Jordan do America. Uh, there's an Anthony Bourdain on the table with Eric Repair. Anthony Bourdain guest stars. I mean, I fanboy. Huh? Yeah, I, I fanboys that, up there. I exactly. Fanboy. That's fantastic. Hey, written by a kid. That's a Geek and Sundry show. Kim yeah. Show. So, you know, they're, what, they're doing a really good job of saying, look, we're going to try to find what we consider to be the most interesting and coolest shows happening on the web the way we would say, here are the most interesting and coolest shows on TV and put them on here. But they're, I think if I, if I don't have this wrong, I think this actually shows up in the print edition as well. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, this is good news all around, man. So uh, Again, no, I, I, it's kind of a USA Today. Some people in the chat room may scoff, but it's read by people in hotels all across the country. So. It is It is quite literally the only print newspaper I ever lay eyes upon. It's the only one, because the only time I ever see a print newspaper is when I'm traveling and it's everywhere. It's at every airport and it's something you can pick up for a few seconds and set down. I think, uh, good. I'm, I love USA Today. Stop besmirching my favorite newsprint edition of newspaper, sir. Uh, Red Dwarf X has had their first trailer for the 10th season released. If you're a Red Dwarf fan, you'll definitely want to check it out. Uh, there's nice scenes with Crichton in there and, and Lister and everybody you'd expect. Can I confess something? I never watched a single episode of Red Dwarf. I think you've confessed that on the show. Uh, that's why I didn't build you up to it, particularly. John. I, can confess, I can confess the same. Yeah, never watched Red Dwarf. Nope. It, now's the time. You can get in on the ground floor and now, then be ready for the new season. Is this going to be like the Doctor Who, re, I don't want to say reboot, but the restart of the Doctor Who series? where No, there's a, I, don't, I don't think so. I think this is really, it's a, it's a six-episode full season uh, shot December through January 2011, 2012. But I think it's the original cast. It's the original cast, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's them trying to continue the story as, as if they had been doing shows this whole time. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I like that. Not a reboot, that's- not a reimagining. Sure. Uh, Mindy Kaling's new sitcom, The Mindy Project, is coming out in the fall, but it will be premiering online before the fall season officially starts. Uh, the pilot for that uh, is coming out, available for viewing for two weeks starting August 27th and premieres on TV September 25th. Also, uh, Ben and Kate, a Fox sitcom, which I know nothing about, is doing the same thing. I hear that it stars people who are going to play Ben and Kate. That's not Ben Affleck and Kate Beckinsale, if that's what you're that, <laughs> Or is it? Jamie I'll- Fravel at Boing Boing makes that point perfectly clear. <laughs> sure. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. We also have uh, I'm Lost. Larry King. Oh, we saw a little uh, po- post about this in USA Today. Larry King returns uh, with Larry King Now on Hulu. Now, is this going to be live or post-edited? I assume it's post-edited. Uh, yeah. But they will debut around the same evening time, Monday through Thursday. So it'll be as if it were live. Yeah, sure. Uh, wow. 78 years old, dude. Larry King, legend. And uh, he retired. Internet pioneer, man. He couldn't stay retired. Yeah. Well, and plus also, I mean, it's the perfect situation for him. It's like he gets he he went out with a bang at the top of his game on CNN. And now this allows him to do something that's pretty much the same, but different enough. And if, and he gets to, you know, obviously he made a lot of news. This is this is from um uh, this is from the world's richest man in Mexico. Right. What's his name? Carlos Slim. No. Uh, yes. Wait. The Yes. Correct. That's the, that's it's his network, isn't it? Yeah. Right, yeah. it's in partnership with that network and Hulu, correct, I think. Yeah. Uh, Hulu has also entered into a co-production with the BBC to shoot the fourth season of The Thick of It, a UK comedy. Have you? I've, I've not even heard of The Thick yeah, of I'm It. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but again, it's just one of those milestones with Hulu and a, and, you know, a major producer, in this case the BBC, uh, teaming up on something uh, to produce it. So, so Hulu will bring it to the U.S. 
Well, and speaking of uh, the other story that, that pops to mind is the recent uh, crossover success of of Kevin Smith's spoilers being on on Canadian television. Uh, if if you haven't listened to it, uh, Kevin Smith, and of course, uh, if you haven't listened to this podcast, it's extraordinarily filthy. But he did a live Q and A at uh, Comic Con uh, where he talks a lot uh, and, and with a lot of heart about the fact that it is the Wild West and it's a special time in media. And anyone with an idea, anyone with a story to tell and a laptop with a webcam can make their story worldwide and famous. And the the lines are blurrier than they've ever been before between uh, web TV and traditional television. I I highly recommend you check it out. It was was weirdly very, very inspiring. It sort of also reminds me a little bit of of what um, Lilyhammer did, what, what Netflix did with Lilyhammer. Um, and, uh, and and the Norwegian um, channel NRK One, um, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's it's. I, pretty, I love seeing this. I love seeing this too. It's it's more of that model of Hulu's and Netflix's and Amazon Prime saying, "Not going to give us a bunch of TV shows that are new. We'll just make some of our own, and we'll partner with people to do it." Uh, finally, Deadline, of course, has the weekly YouTube channel rankings, and uh, the one thing that stuck out to me here is Machinima Prime. Uh, rocketed up to number four, even though they haven't put out any of their stuff yet. Uh, people are just uh, subscribing and, and watching the uh, the, uh, the introduction videos that they've put up in great numbers. Anything else uh, strike you, Brian? No, no, but but I'll tell you, man, Machinima is, it is a force. It is, at least when, when you see Vivo in the top, you understand why you're like, music videos are popular. I love the repeated shock that people have seeing Machinima right up, right up at the top. People love to watch other people playing video games. Let's move on to the movie draft. So it's a little weird checking in on our summer movie draft uh, this week because we don't have official numbers yet in the, in the, the spreadsheet uh, for, for The Dark Knight because of uh, the events in Colorado last week. Uh, yeah. and, and, and that kind of puts a shadow on the whole weekend, but the unofficial numbers that we've been getting from the analysts are that The Dark Knight did very well. Well, it, it certainly did well enough that uh, that Warner Brothers is happy and certainly breathing a sigh of relief after the, the horrible events of, of this past weekend. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the, the reports seem to indicate that the uh, the incident in, in Colorado did not affect the numbers as much as they feared it would, uh, if, if much at all. But that uh, Dark Knight Rises did not get anywhere close to beating the Avengers – opening weekend debut numbers and that it was um it was sort of underwhelming in that regard and they didn't know that of the reasons that they listed for possibly underperforming they said maybe it's just superhero fatigue maybe it's just they've already had this experience a bunch of times but tell you what man to me draft is now a two-person race now between you and justin robert young i don't think sarah's got the goods now yeah and that, and it's sad because there's going to be an asterisk by the whole season now uh because of those events which just yeah is is Hor- you know, this is the least important effect of that. It's just a, it's a horrible thing uh, to, to even have to consider. Let's move right, on to sure. what we're watching. What we're watching. Now, we both saw The Dark Knight Rises. John, you, did you saw it as well? Yes, I saw it. I okay, saw so it uh... We'll save our opinions to the spoiler zone at the end of the show. Uh, for for those who haven't seen it yet, but just thumbs up, thumbs down b- before we move on. John, two thumbs up, nice. Yeah. One thumb up, one thumb down. One, well, it's I'm one not, thumb I'm shifty. Gonna, I'm not even going to give one thumb down. Uh, it, it'll be a thumb up and another thumb like oh, <laughs> this this thumb could go up. I'm going to do two thumbs angle. No, I do <laughs> one thumb up. There. There no, you go. No two thumbs. Uh, that. <laughs> Uh, Breaking Bad also we'll talk about in the spoiler zone. Uh, what else have you been watching, Brian? Well, I went down to uh, my wife's high school reunion, and so we stayed at her parents' place. And so they threw on the Will Ferrell vehicle, uh, Casa de Mi Padre, and I only watched the first half of it. I don't usually give up on a movie like that, but it's like the joke. I, I was surprised uh, that that the joke just wore thin so fast, and it never took anything to the next level. It just is a straight-up, all-in-Spanish really poorly produced telenovela and that's sort of the the joke and if you think it's hilarious for an hour and a half straight that that's it then you're gonna think it's hilarious and if you just laugh every time you see will ferrell make a confused look then you'll probably giggle a lot during this movie but it wore way thin on me and i sort of i i went and i i wrapped packages 
for my for my parents in law who are moving instead. So uh, on the scale of how many wrapped packages are more fun than this movie, I wrapped, I wrapped six packages. Six I, packages. I wrapped okay. six stained glass items rather than watch the rest of it. All glass <laughs> items too. I did hear them all cackling at the ludicrously awkward sex scene. So apparently there's a lot of hilarious uh, so butt grab. You missed the best part. I, I didn't stick around for it. Uh, one thing that I watched last night that I thought was actually pretty entertaining uh, was Harry Potter and the Ten Years Later. This is a, a series that's out on YouTube uh, from some British folks called Furious Molecules, and it's purporting really? to tell are the they, story. Are they British? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> it's purporting to tell the story of what happened to Harry Potter ten years after the end of the last movie. And some of it's fairly predictable, like, you know, uh, Hermione's getting a divorce and Harry gets laid off from his R position because there's nobody to fight anymore. Uh, but, you know, he's looking at his fantasy Quidditch stats at the beginning. Uh, it, it's it's a little uneven, but overall, I, I watched it all the way through. I thought there were some pretty funny moments. Yeah, I'll give that a try. I mean, is it worth the, is it one of those things that's only adorable if you're in love with Harry Potter or is it something that just stands on its own? I think you're only going to get it and think it's funny if you've watched Harry Potter enough to to get the jokes. You, I don't know if you have to absolutely have loved it, but I, I think you have to have seen all the movies. All right. Yeah. Well, we got lots of feedback and uh, lots of spoilers to it's spoil. It's time so for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. First email comes from Joe. I'm watching the Frame Rate episode about Dish dropping AMC on the Roku uh, box, uh, on the Roku box that Dish sent me. So he's watching that show on his Roku box. Uh, they sent me this box and a $35 credit to purchase the show via Amazon to make up for dropping AMC. So Dish doing some positive things here as well, right? Well, yeah, and I think it's curious that the problem is is they're not media savvy enough to 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 make sure to do those things in a public forum where everyone can appreciate it and root for them. I mean, it's it's weirdly because they don't want to buy too many Rokus. <laughs> well, it's it's very old school for Dish to quietly make individual customers extremely happy, and instead, but that's not how the battle for for goodwill is won nowadays. Nowadays, you got to grandstand in front of the public and and make your case in that regard. Uh, okay, so this one we got from, let me go ahead, here we go, I'm going to go ahead and paste this over here for you, Jason, because it looks like this thing got put in the wrong spot and I can't put it in there for some reason. Uh, there we go, Seth Brower says, to frame rate, a friend and co-worker of mine whose day job has been visual effects supervisor on numerous projects, most frequently Bones, uh, spent his own money, I've heard differing amounts, and put together this 20-minute Why the Last Man fan film. It's getting a little buzz around the net. Thought that it would be right up your alley to discuss or at least mention. Keep up the awesome show. Dude, uh, first of all, if you have not read Why the Last Man, it's a complete beginning, middle, end comic book. The whole story is, is it's, it's, it's a whole arc. It's not like uh, your regular superhero stuff where it just keeps on going forever. This thing uh, is a story in a world where all the men die at exactly the same time. And it's what happens to society as women are the only one in charge. And there's one guy, there's one guy who is still alive. His name's Yorick, and he's got a, um, a male monkey that also curiously stays alive. And this thing is so good that it was actually a problem for me watching it. This is a fan film. They have a big fat disclaimer at the beginning that says not affiliated with, with Vertigo Comics or Why the Last Man or... Uh, is it Brian K. Vaughn? Is that who wrote this one? Yeah, Brian. Yeah, Brian K. Vaughn. It's a, and, uh, and, but the thing is, is with a lot of fan films, they feel like fan films. So you can just, you immediately find yourself forgiving a lot of, of problems. This thing looks so good. It smacks right into the uncanny valley to where, as a result, you notice things like uh, talking, talking to Tom. He said he noticed some miking issues. I noticed a couple of kludgy visual effects but like that is such a good thing because everything Wait, the, about the looks, fact that you're noticing those things is that is, is that you're actually you're you're viewing it as something more than a fan film exactly it busts out of the fan film quality bracket and and goes all the way into like you could tell me with a straight face that this was a pilot for fox that did not get picked up and i would absolutely have believed it if you dug that story you've got to watch this thing and you look at the credits. I mean, they had a ton of people working on this. You know, they they had visual effects processors. They have property masters, set dressers, you know, the kinds of things you need on, on a high-level production. It wasn't just a couple of people with cameras running around, and it shows. 
Well, and go back, uh, if you can, Jason, uh, take a look at the very beginning when everything's going crazy in the airplane. I mean, they've got a fantastic airplane set that's at least as good as any movie that I've seen out there. I mean, the cockpit looks fine here, but at one point you see the entire place shaking around and bodies flying everywhere. And it look, I don't know if they actually shot it on an airplane or what. I mean, what about it, the helicopter? There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at it, yeah. so we're just going to yeah. feel the, airplane, the outside of the airplane looks a little, a little. That was definitely uh, a U.S. Airways. Yeah, like, I don't know if you Photoshop. remember the, the four of that, that old video, 405. Yeah, yeah the 405. Yeah. Where the, where the Which airplane. was, well, like at the time it was like mind blowing. But if you like look at the plane now, it's like, oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> but uh, but congratulations to. Uh, and again, that's. Um, oh, I'm trying to find the name of him. Um, Seth. Uh, uh, well, no, Seth is the one who sent it in to us. Let me actually, he he gave us the IMDb link. Uh, oh. Christian Cardona. That's, uh, congratulations to Christian Cardona. This Cardone. is like probably the most exciting thing on the list of, of things that I saw. Because, I mean, I'm a, a huge fan of Why the Last Man. And, and so is Cosimo. And it was, uh, deaf, people who watch H+, Plus will certainly see that we were influenced greatly influenced by that story i love a good and it was, and it, story and it was a very exciting uh a fan film i i have to say and i was doing exactly the same thing i was nitpicking little things and then saying wait a second this is a fan film <laughs> i know yes, i i yes. said i sat down to just preview it like oh, okay I'll, I'll i'll take a look at this get the flavor of it so i can read the email and i ended up watching all 20 minutes it's yeah. really really well done uh, Blockman Bing disagrees with you brian he thinks ario will advance uh he, he does not think ario will advance uh, reform of copyright law. Uh, supporting Ario is saying we do not need any reform of copyright law. He also says, just to correct one thing I said, I don't necessarily think we need radical copyright law reform, but we do need radical changes in the market. The point that Brian's saying we're supporting Ario will advance copyright law reform being false was my point. And he says more than that in there, but I, well, and I'm, I'm like, allow me to rebut simply by saying there is absolutely, you could sit on the sidelines and say, well, what we ought to do is giant sweeping copyright reform and i'll tell you flat out will never ever happen all changes in this regard are going to be incremental and small and it's going to happen because of of cases like this should we uh, finish up with the last email from tim yeah he says just a, a just a quick question as a side bet who would you pick to have the most box office dollars this summer between avengers co-stars chris hemsworth of avengers snow white and the huntsman cabin in the woods and Jeremy Renner of Avengers and Born Legacy. Hemsworth is at $808 million at the time of this writing. Justin and Sarah have a good chance of cracking the $800 million mark, but could an all-Hemsworth draft have beaten out all of the hosts? Yeah, well, first of all, it's not hard to retroactively beat out the hosts. I mean, you'll notice that the chat realm always has numbers way bigger than any of the hosts. But I guess really, since Avengers is going to be a wash between both of the actors, essentially it's Snow White and the Huntsman plus Cabin in the Woods, versus just the born legacy and i gotta tell you snow white and the huntsman um what, what did that do like less than 100 million right yeah or i don't did remember it? i don't know i'm gonna look it up i my gut tells me to go with uh to to go with uh jeremy renner for sure snow white and the huntsman here it's one, one 152 yeah okay i was too wrong million. with that but i'll tell you the uh the born the born legacy is going to make at least uh, 160 170 million total i'm i think I would go with Jeremy Renner. All right. We're going to move into the spoiler zone, folks. If you don't want to be spoiled on anything regarding The Dark Knight and Breaking Bad, move away slowly or rapidly from your internet and or a television on which you are watching this. Uh, for those who are leaving, though, John Cabrera, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us. Are you going to stick around for the spoiler zone? Sure. All right. Uh, let yeah. folks know, Spoil again, when H Plus is uh, premiering, what they can find there and where they can find it. It's premiering on August 8th at uh, youtube.com forward slash H plus digital series. Um, and, uh, and they'll be able to, to find as of right now, they'll be able to, to start um, watching some of the, uh, some of the videos that were trickling in um, ancillary content that, that kind of supports the series and, and the story that's going to start on August 8th, um, a 48 episode series episodes, roughly between you know, three and six minutes long. Um, in total, the, the, the series is four network hours. Um, yeah. I am looking forward to it. I can't wait to, to, to dig into the, to the new stuff. I've already watched what you got up there so far. Uh, so I'm, I'm dying for, for the new stuff to start trickling in. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. 
All right, thanks everybody for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. We're live at live.twit.tv every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. You can email us and be on the show with your email, framerate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time. All right, which one do we want to talk about first? Um, uh, let's just get Breaking Bad out of the way. Do you watch right? Breaking Bad? John? I don't watch Breaking Bad. Maybe we should Bad. start with The Dark Knight then. Okay, yeah, because right. then I, may, I, might, I might check out if yeah, you guys yeah. don't watch Breaking Bad because I am going to start watching that. Okay, well, good on you, man. Definitely watch Breaking Bad. But let's talk about uh, uh, Dark Knight. Who wants to go first? I'm chicken too. I'll go first. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not afraid. Um, I am. First half of the movie, if you had come in and said, what do you think? I would have been uh, like trepidation saying, I'm kind of disappointed. There was some clunky exposition. I felt like it was dragging a little. I loved uh, Anne Hathaway all the way through. I thought she was great. I actually thought Tom Hardy was fantastic as well. So I was still enjoying it, but I was worried. And then the second half picked up. Uh, I absolutely loved it. I, I loved the way it ended, even if it was a little bit of a pat ending in some people's opinion. Uh, and it entirely redeemed it. And it, it was the worst of the Dark Knight movies, but that's still saying it's a great movie. Uh, I actually disagree. I liked it more than than the Dark Knight. And I know I'm the only person on planet you mean Earth. The, who, the no, second no movie? you're not you're not you're not the only person on planet Earth, man. I, I, I feel exactly the same way. I wasn't I wasn't crazy about Dark Knight Returns, to be honest with you. I, I thought that that uh, that Ledger's performance was incredible. And we certainly didn't get anything like that in this film. But just in terms of a film on a whole, I felt like Rises was just um, a far, far better film. Yeah, okay, now, uh, man, you, you're the one. You're the only other person who agrees with me on this. Like, Because previously, I had always said that Batman Begins was better than, than The Dark Knight. Uh, but let me, let me say this. Uh, I agree completely. The, if, if you only watch the first half of the movie, I'd be tempted to say it's a pretty hot mess. And the problem is, when you try to cover so much material, it becomes a collage. And a collage can cover a very wide breadth of material, but, but you don't get a lot of depth, and it's frustrating at times. Now, having said that, the third act of this movie was exquisite. I love the idea of, of the people's, people's Republic of Gotham. You know, and the, the the one thing I wish was I wish they'd given us more context of of the amount of time that went into this. The only way you could even tell that it had been three months was that there was suddenly snow on the ground, and that you caught like a five second snippet on on the screen. If you happen to look at the screen where CNN said day 89 of the crisis or whatever, how much better would it have been if you just had 30 or 40 seconds of sort of just news reports setting up over the next months how they set up a supply line to get food and water to these people uh, and, and, and how... And, I would I would have loved to see more of the descent into chaos in Gotham. The yeah, other- but I mean, I feel like that's just part of that's part of the way that Christopher Nolan tells his stories. I mean, like, you know, there was that one shot where uh, where, um, you know, uh, Wayne wa- uh, um, walks out of the it's like right after he's found out that his that his fortune is gone and he walks out and you see like his car is already being repossessed. You know, it's like. Everything is sort of, I feel like it's sort of shorthand in, in, in films like these. And, and once you get over that, I think that the, the film is extremely enjoyable. And I felt like, it, to, to your point there, I felt like all of that was just, you were supposed to accept that there was some speeding up of things, that we don't really sure. need to, to, to see all of that, that we, that we just sort of get things have moved into, into the future. And I'm usually not bothered by that stuff either. For some reason, most of that stuff, I wasn't bothered by the, the speeding up of the 89 days necessarily, but when they decided to explain to me everything about how the nuclear device worked in a monologue, right. I felt yeah. like that, okay. I, 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 wanted a little, I wanted yeah. a little more there. There, there was in this movie. There was entirely too much telling and not enough showing. I mean, uh, Justin, Robert Young, and I last night were joking that it was almost like Alfred spent the whole first act reading entries from the Wikipedia article about the movie, explaining everything that's going to be set up. Now, when you get to the end, you understand why they had to set up all these things. But uh, again, I would have preferred to have seen more of this than 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 felt it. Now, on the flip side, uh, I, I'm going to make that comparison that nobody wants to make. 
uh, between the Avengers and the Dark Knight. There, if you put them side by side, there's a few interesting, notable differences. One, of course, one is is trying to play at the drama angle much, much more. But one of the downsides of that is, whereas the Avengers was able to give you a squirt of serotonin every 30 seconds on the mark, and then every three minutes to give you a good, big punch in the gut, whether it was a joke, whether it was a plot twist, whether it was a fight scene, you got something nonstop the entire time long. Whereas, like, I found myself kind of getting bored from time to time, especially in the first two thirds of, of the dark night. And the other thing was I admire Nolan's use of practical effects. He actually built objects to be the, the, the bat cycle and be the bat, the, I, I guess it was the bat wing, but now they just called the bat. But the problem with practical effects is that they move like physical objects. And when, when the turret moves, if it was computer generated, it would be this, this kind of smooth head, heavy turn. But instead you sort of got this, you know, Herky kind of clunky thing. I love, yeah. but I love that. You didn't I liked like that? that too. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Uh, I I I didn't mind it so much on the tanks, but I did mind it a lot on the bat because I I, I just really? felt like they just erased the crane that it was held on to, and it didn't. Can we talk? Can we talk about the first seven minutes of this film, though? You guys keep saying that that you weren't crazy about the opening or the the first part of the film, but do, how did you guys feel about those first seven minutes? Okay, I, one of the problems with the first seven minutes was that I had seen it in a teaser in front of another movie. And oh, okay. when I saw it in that teaser, I was like, this is amazing, I can't wait to see The Dark Knight now. And sadly, when I watched it this time, I was like, okay, yeah, no, I know what's going to happen because well, you know, oh, I already right. saw that. Oh, so I, I think I that, that was unfortunate. It. I found it unfortunate that the first lines from Bane are the weakest execution of the voice effect uh, out there, where it's just like, a, you know, all of a sudden it sounds like um, robot Sean Connery talking in there. And I was I was unprepared for that. And I remember kind of cringing like, is this going to be OK? And eventually you get used to it and it sounds fine. Although it did seem to me like they went way overboard because there were complaints originally that yeah. the Bane voice was hard to understand. The Bane voice is three times louder than anything else in any scene that he's in. And as a result, it doesn't feel real. It feels like... Um, it feels like, like all ADR, the entire the, the entire film. You just feel like everything he's done was done in a studio. Well, when you're but, older, you'll appreciate that. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I was fine with it. I, I It didn't bother me at all. In fact, my biggest problem with um, Dark Knight Returns is that I couldn't understand what anybody was saying. It was, the, the sound in that in that last film for me was just atrocious. I couldn't well, understand a single piece of dialogue. I was completely confused all the way through. And in this one, I mean, and then when I heard those stories about how people in test screenings were complaining that they couldn't understand what Bain was saying, I was like, oh, I'm going to hate this. I'm going to hate it. And so I, I, I welcomed it. I loved it. I loved that I could hear everything and it was good. And I followed the story and, it, so, you know. uh, did anyone else find the the scene where Alfred, like uh, the, the whole first act, Alfred's spending his whole time like, "Come on, get out there, boss! Get out there, boss!" And the first he, the first time he gets out there, he says, "I'm leaving you, Master Wayne." Uh, that scene where he starts crying and decides he's going to run off. It doesn't sound like C three PO, by the way. Just, <laughs> yeah, Master Wayne, I'm leaving you. Uh, but the uh, it was weird to me, and I don't normally notice this kind of thing in cinema. But I'm pretty sure that scene with Alfred. Uh, every other conversation in the movie is shot reverse shot over the shoulder. So you so you get the context of who they're talking to. That scene in the stairwell with him and Alfred is different from all the others because you get no over the shoulder shots. It's just people staring slightly off of a camera on a front view. And it, it, it felt very weird to me. Did anyone else notice that? Mm. It's hard to shoot on stairs, I, Brian. I didn't. I'd... Could be. Could be. It's possible yeah. that that's what it was. It yeah, did not jump maybe... out at me. All right. Nobody else in the chat room is agreeing. Either. Or maybe that was a scene they threw in there, you know, and they they had to, you know, they had to do it with uh, with Michael Caine alone. I don't know. Yeah, that's possible. All right. I want to know whose shoulder that was. Then <laughs> I'm always yeah. interested in that stuff. I, you know, I I ended up loving the movie in the end, and I think part of the reason was to a lesser extent Joseph Gordon Levitt, but but Anne Hathaway especially, and Tom Hardy really just stole the show in, in their various respects. And so even though there may have been a, a little bit of a uh, of laggy story, I was enjoying their characters so much that when it did all come together and it came together well at the end, it, it, I, I had that grin on my face 
I wish I had had through the whole thing. Uh, yeah. But but I think I think Anne Hathaway stole the show. I really yeah. wish if if there's one thing I could have gotten if I could do my genie wish I uh, instead of having. Alfred described the fact that Bane came from a terrible prison. I would have loved to have seen the prison beforehand. And when Batman got defeated, I would love it more if if it wasn't just he punched off his mask and then suddenly Batman wakes up in a prison that we have no context of where it is or what it means. I would have loved to have seen the prison before and I would have loved to have seen Batman utterly broken, like 30 seconds of torture porn to make me really cringe uh, to where, like, I knew he was broken and defeated and on the other side of the world. But instead, he just punches off the mask, and then suddenly he's, he's in a place that, that we're told is remote and hard it's to get Bruce to. It's Bruce Neckerstein. Exactly. It's yeah. like I would have loved, I loved, I loved more seeing and, and less telling. I think that, that, that is true for a lot of things. That, that one particularly didn't bother me the most, but there, there are definitely a lot of things I would have liked to have seen. Uh, uh, last thoughts from you, John. I liked it. Yeah, it was a good movie. You know, I dug it. I, I thought it was it was great. I mean, I I felt like everything came together in the end. I got a little choked up, and you know, for me, I, like I said, I was I was not into the last movie. I I, I didn't I didn't enjoy it. I, I I thought that Heath Ledger's performance was great, but that was about it. And and uh, and then Batman Begins. I thought that that the first two acts of that film were fantastic, and then the last act of the film was you know silly. So um, for me to kind of get to the end of this and and feel really like emotionally um, like emo- emotionally worked up, I, I I think it it was a success. At least for me, it was. Oh, let let me chime in one other thing. Uh, when I saw the the Dark Knight, the second movie, uh, I saw it in an IMAX theater, and I think that was a huge mistake because it felt sterile and clinical. I felt like I was in class. It was it was not a fun place and the audience wasn't loud and raucous and having a good time. Saw this one, just regular old digital projection in uh, at an Alamo draft house. Best decision ever. Made all the difference. Had a great time. All right. Well, John, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, man. It was yeah. really good talking to you. I'm really glad that you guys uh, had me on and it you're was wel- fun. You're welcome back anytime. Uh, if you got any more announcements or anything, let us know. Uh, we'd love to have you back. Awesome. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Thanks, we're, guys. We're going to talk about Breaking Bad, so go away. All yeah, right. Yeah. Later. <laughs> All right. Breaking Bad only from here on out. Uh, by the way, it should be noted that uh, I saw a late night show of The Dark Knight last night and got in around 1.30 and started watching Breaking Bad around 2 a.m., intending just to watch the first 10 minutes without Bonnie, but ended up watching the entire thing. So I was very enthralled. I thought... I thought they were doing a great job of reminding you the real menace. There was more menace in this. Even with all the crime stuff, there's shocking moments of Breaking Bad. But I can't remember an episode that had this much like, these are dark people who do dark things. And it's not a nice world at all. It felt. Did it feel darker to you? I'm just making sure everyone has had a chance to leave. If they don't want to be spoiled on Breaking Bad. Uh, yes, I absolutely do agree. Uh, the, uh, the, the, you are, I, I've said this before because I knew it was coming, but you're going to hate Walt by the end of this, this, sh- this series, this entire mm-hmm. show. Uh, and you really start to feel that in this episode. Uh, and you know what's funny? Uh, the direct TV recording of Breaking Bad for us got messed up with audio it was yep, just it was just a too. bad broadcast uh problem and i don't know if it was encoding on their side or something eileen didn't want to watch it she's like oh this is all messed up i'm like yeah they're all speaking in german anyway just read the subtitles and what was crazy is right at the point where they pretty much stop speaking german and it's being subtitled it cleared up huh so do you think it might have just been bad arrangement to begin with? or No, really I think was- it was because the rerun was fine. She went back okay. and, and watched it on the rerun to get like to see if anything was different. There really wasn't. Uh, but that scene with the tasting at the beginning uh, was just, yeah, it was it was so compelling and weird. And you just want to know more about Madrigal and why are they taking the Poyos Hermanos sign down like that. Right. Nothing in this show goes goes by meaning nothing. Like everything well, that happens, like almost off stage, ends up playing back somehow, so, somewhere later. I I also loved. Uh, well, hold on, I, I got to form my thought. Jason, was there something you wanted to chime in? You watched it, right? 
Oh, no, I, do, I was just kind of confirming. It. I had the same kind of glitch at the start and kind of had the same experience where it was like, uh, well, I guess it's in subtitles, so it doesn't matter. Almost turned it off. So glad I didn't. I absolutely love the episode. And you're absolutely right, Tom, like that the dark kind of uh, where he's going from from a dark perspective, you're, you're starting to really kind of hate him as a character. Well, and, and I think also... Uh, you know, for so many seasons leading up to this face-off with Gus Fring, uh, and you feel like, well, it's over, and what are they going to do on this next season? But I love how there's a real denouement. There is a final chapter, and Gus is not the end-all, be-all of where things are headed with this. And you kind of, you kind of smell where things, where things are are headed from a police investigation standpoint. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all the way in. No loss of quality whatsoever. Totally, totally digging it. What about that moment where Hank is speaking to his boss who's leaving and his boss is talking about having Fring over for barbecue and, oh, God, yes. and says, gosh, there he was right under my nose the whole Brent time <laughs> and I didn't know it. Why was I so stupid? I, I couldn't tell. And this is what's so brilliant about the way they do Breaking Bad. I couldn't tell if Hank was thinking along those lines or just thinking how horrible that would be like totally something's totally. going on in his mind but yeah no i totally read it when i read it i read it as an epiphany moment for him or or at least an opening up like but that there are certain moments kind you ever notice of epiphany that, right well well th you ever notice that there are certain moments that the moment they happen you know it's going to show up in the previously on breaking bad for like the next five episodes i feel like that moment that comment in his look I think is going to show up repeatedly for the next few episodes in the previously ons. Now, Knox Harrington in the chat room just said Walt always has some reason why he's cooking meth before because uh, it wasn't about him. Now he's going to be doing it simply because he wants to. I think you're right, Knox, but he does have a real reason. He doesn't have the money that he yes. had before. Oh. So, so the money is still there to make him feel like he's doing it for a reason that's not him. And he says, it's, you know, it's all about family. But when he says it now, it doesn't sound like Walt, the school teacher, saying, I need to protect my family. It sounds like a drug lord saying, it's all about family. It's like Stringer Bell from The Wire yes. saying, it's family, man. Or, or uh, Barksdale uh, saying, you, it's all about family, brother. It, it striked, and it's funny because Eileen's re -watch, or watching The Wire, so I'm re-watching some of the episodes with her. And the way Walt says family really echoes Avon Barksdale. So uh, two things real quick. Number one, can we agree that Mike is the best character on the show uh, at the moment? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I, no, I, I, I'm cheering for Mike now. Yes. And second of all, uh, how far has Eileen gone in the wire? Like, is she getting all the way in? Yeah, she's, uh, I don't know, a little bit over halfway through that first season, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, she uh, because both you, you realize that Sarah Lane is playing yeah, along I know. as well. And uh, she was saying that four episodes in, she wasn't feeling it. And I, I felt the need to intervene on Twitter. I'm like, look, I didn't feel it the whole first season. And and it'll take a while till you feel it. But when you feel it, it'll change your life. It's the best series ever. Well, the thing is, I mean, Eileen's saying that she's still waiting for that aha moment to love it. Mm -hmm. But she's also eating it like candy. Like, she's Good. just, like, first thing in the morning, Saturday morning, she is, boom, press and play, watching The Wire. So she's got awesome. the bug. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, she dude, got I them guess red that's tops. It. Them WMDs. WMDs. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so that's it for our spoiler zone. Thanks, everybody, if you uh, stuck around and watched it. You know, uh, we had a suggestion from somebody uh, over email to break out the spoiler zone on YouTube so you could watch just the spoiler zone later on when you were ready for it. Uh, and uh, talk to Glenn Rubenstein, who's in charge of our promotions and stuff, and, and he's into it. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look into doing that and breaking those out. We'll, we'll have to, when we do that, we'll have to make sure to title it, title it discussion. You know, um, it'll have to be like spoiler zone discussion of, we yes. have to get exact episode seasons and episode numbers. S-O-1-E-O-3 and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, there you go.